Welcome to another Word Up Bible Study. I am Reverend Dr. James Duncans, and I am excited about the content and the response that you have had to the content of this Bible study. Thank you for joining us this evening. I don't want to neglect to say that many of you have been tuning in. You've been sending me messages about how effective this study is. For those who are just joining us, this is part three of this relevant message about understanding how to have victory over your stress, your anxiety, and your fears. In short, we've been talking about mental health, but I've been approaching mental health from this perspective of stress, anxiety, and fears, because a lot of times we don't want to admit how deep of depth our fears go. Uh, many of us have gotten so used to dysfunctioning function that we don't even let ourselves question or enter or go to the place where our fears dwell. And in spite of that, our fears and our anxieties are driving our life and God did not expect, does not want, and has the ability to help you overcome and be victorious. When I say overcome and be victorious, I've been very clear to put this disclaimer out. And that is you need to understand that this means you can handle them. In the times that we're living in, um, mental health, everybody's mental health is being assaulted from all sides. None of us are exempt from the pressures of daily living. Uh, stress, anxiety, fears, depression uh, are part of the fallen nature of our flesh. We got to deal with them. So you tuned into the right place so we can learn how to deal. And can I read the text that we're looking at right now? is in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 14. A powerful text, and I'm going to pick up tonight, and I'll explain why we're starting here as I get into the lesson. I'm going to pick up tonight with verse 15. Are you ready? John, chapter 14, verse 15. Now, even in my own Bible, it's all in red. So I'm letting one, everyone know there's an added benefit of knowing Jesus Christ himself spoke these words directly to his disciples. Here's what John 14, 14, 15 said. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Tell somebody right now, we're going there in this text. We've been going verse by verse. Tonight we're going to talk about God the Holy Spirit. So you want somebody to understand and get this message because we're talking about the Comforter, the third person of the triune God, God the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwells in you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more. But you see me, because I live, you live also. At that day, you shall know that I am in the Father, and ye in me, and I in you. I'm in the Father, you're in me. This is Jesus speaking, and I'm in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved by the Father. And I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas said unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace. I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. 
let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And we go down to that last verse, and Jesus said unto them, but that, verse 31, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even I so do you. Look what he said, arise, let us go in. After speaking with his disciples, he said, let's get up and let's go forward. That's what I'm going to do. You have to be praying. I'm going to tell you how to go forward despite the stress and the anxieties and trouble that we're all facing. Let's pray. Father God, again, we seek your will, your wisdom. And Lord, we seek to understand how much you love us, how much you keep us, how much you care for us. But most of all, God, I pray for someone who is constantly dealing with insomnia or anxiety or they feel depressed or it seems like the world is closing in on them let them hear the messages from your word let them hear this word tonight and find a place of comfort and peace in jesus name amen again let's start here none of us are exempt we can all go from and i've been there a low-grade worry to a full-blown panic attack how many know that's what can happen in our lives and they give you all kinds of remedies, therapy, change of diet, medication. All of these things work. And I'm just going to reiterate again. I did a full series on mental health. You got to go back and look at some of the technical language about mental health. Because tonight, I'm trying to give you a biblical understanding about how to find peace. But you need to understand that medication, all of that, I agree. But I shared with you, medication and those things are temporary relief. A doctor will tell you they're constantly adjusting Medication, it's temporary. Then you know you got other side effects going on. You got to adjust the medication to that. But take it because medication is there for those times when you're in extreme pain, those times of an emergency, those times when you just need to get a quick fix. And they are. They will go right in. Oh, let me tell you what I'm talking about. Part of my, my background is um, I've been bivocational most of my working life. Um, I've been a pastor and I was an educator for 28 years. In education, I was certified as a teacher of the handicap. That meant that I dealt with special education children. But I was also certified as a school social worker. For many years, I did work with the child study team. In our child study, I would perform the social histories. That means that I went about, if a child was acting out in school, and we were thinking about trying to get a better education plan for this child, I went out and did a social history, which was to make sure the environment that the child was living in now, in the environment, environment that the child grew up in, the background, how it was adding to or how it affected the child's acting out and their behavior. If I got into an environment where there was a lot of cursing at the child, you'd be surprised some of the things I've seen. Smacking, shooting them down, telling them they weren't going to be anything, and wonder why the child wasn't you know, prospering. But I saw all of that. Uh, to, and it, very, it was very heartless at times what parents were doing to the children. But at any rate, and we figured out how this was contributing to the child's education. And some of the manifestations of these behaviors, mental health behaviors, real serious problems, uh, one of the most common, there was depression, uh, there were children who uh, very similarly may have been dealing with all kind of anxiety disorders. And one of the most prevalent is ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Attention deficit. So when they did that, I, what they would do, and a lot of times I knew why, they would give the child Ritalin. Ritalin is from a class of drugs called SSRs or uh, Select Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. That means it went into the brain, it stopped serotonin, it stopped the stimulation and activity. But here's the problem. If a child would get on Ritalin, sometimes the dose was so strong that the child would walk around like a zombie. Other times, the teacher would say it wasn't affecting the child. All in all, they had to continue adjusting it. No problem. Take your medication. I'm just telling you what I'm familiar with. But the word of God is effective. The word of God does not give temporary relief. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us the word of God grows and takes you from glory to glory. The more you read it. That's why sometimes you can read a scripture that you used to read or that you haven't read in a while and it'll just blow your mind because that new scripture will find a place in you that will bless you because the word of God works in our soul. What is our soul? The Bible tells us we are spirit, soul, and body. Stay with me. First Thessalonians 5.23. And the very God of peace 
sanctify you holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. When Paul was talking to the church at Thessalonica, he, inspired, he told them, you are a tripart being. You are spirit, soul, and body. God, God's word goes into our soul. What is our soul? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us we don't have a soul. We are a soul with a body. At the end of everything, your soul is going to be last. It's going to be left. So your soul is what's being ministered to. Many times in the Bible, you'll hear someone talked about as being a soul. Because that's where God wants to work. You know what our soul is? It's our mind, our will, and our emotions. There it is. It's all that realm of the mental health. My soul. Stay with me. Somebody's hearing it. And the word of God can touch that soul. Look at 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Verse 7. Casting all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Watch out. Once you get your mind infused, infected by the word of God, something happens that covers the brain, the body, and all the chemistry in it because God created us. And it says, you learn, once I trust him, I can cast my cares on him. All that means is at that moment, I believe God has this situation under control. I'm telling somebody, watch me tonight, casting your cares comes from learning the word of God, getting yourself positioned in the word so that you believe what the word is saying. And it will go directly into your emotions, your will, and your mind, and it will change you. Come on, most of us know verses Philippians 6 and 7, chapter 4 of Philippians. Be careful or anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds. Here's what the Bible tells us. When that word hits us, it tells us that we can be anxious for nothing if we pray. Here go the weapons. Prayer. Supplication. All supplication is, get this, is more concentrated, heartfelt prayer. It means I cry out to God. The word to supplicate means that I say it. That's why I tell you don't believe those folk that say you pray it once and then you just stand there and grit. No. If you pray at 8 o'clock and you got no relief, pray it again at 9 o'clock. If you pray at 12 o'clock, Keep rehearsing. Keep that word in your mind so that you can be blessed and God will bless you. So prayer, supplication, right? And thanksgiving. Be thankful. You want to see something that will take away gloom better than anything else? Learn how to be thankful to God. And all of us got something to be thankful for. And God said, I will give you a peace that passeth understanding. And John 16, 33 is another foundation or bedrock scripture where Jesus Christ himself said to you, so you won't go off the other end when things are happening to you. These things I have spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Underline John 16, 33. Jesus said, the reason I gave you this word, did you hear it? I'm giving you a prescription. The reason I gave you this word is so you might have peace. Where? In me. Jesus said, real peace is in me. He said, in the world, you're going to have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Somebody ought to praise God right there with me. Jesus said, in me is peace. That should give you a strong reason. It should give you an inclination to say, I want to know what this is saying. All of those verses are good. But none are as powerful as what Jesus said in this 14th chapter. Well, all of them are powerful. But this 14th chapter sets you up with let not your heart be troubled. Gave you the background. Jesus, somebody's going gave them the understanding of what God was doing in their life. He said, all these things have I given you in this text. So the first part of this text I gave you was knowing that the biggest reason you cannot get blessed is because you don't understand, watch this, or you don't have faith in the sovereignty of God. Watch what God's sovereignty is. God's sovereignty is his control. Do you believe God is able to control and run your life? Then you ought to put a yay right there. If you believe God is in control, why show you worry? If you're worrying, it means you don't believe 
God has all of this covered. Do you hear me? When you believe God has it covered, you don't have to worry because it means that our God is sovereign. He does what he wants, when he wants, how he wants, and I know he wants to deliver me. That was verses 1 through 8. Then we picked up verses 8 through 14 last week, and we talked about that time, the gift of his deliverance. In this pericope, in this chapter, he left us these three divisions of things. He said, first of all, trust my sovereignty. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe in me. Then he said, the gift of deliverance, when he gave them the verses about you can do the same works that I can do. Now we're picking up with verse 15. Come on, go with me. Verse 15 says, if you love me, keep my commandments. We're talking about now God's promise of comfort to you. That's what this last section is about. God said, you should not be worried because I promised you comfort. So the first thing he said to the disciples as he switched gears, if you love me, keep my commandment. There is one of the main problems tonight. It has nothing to do with what I'm preaching. It has nothing to do with what I'm saying. It has everything to do with something. One of the greatest tragedies in the body of Christ in this new era is they place faith above love. They make faith an all in all. They teach you all of this faith talk. But the problem is, if you don't love God, you don't have faith. Faith without love won't work. I'm sitting here talking to somebody that want to be delivered. I'm talking to somebody that don't want to be in trouble. I'm talking to somebody that can't sleep at night. Dealing with insomnia. I'm talking to somebody who's wondering where God is. If you love me, God said, keep my commandments. Here's the problem. God said, you can't get what I'm giving you if you don't love me. 1 Corinthians 13, you know the verse. Just verse 1 and 2 I'll give you. But chapter 13 is the chapter that God is letting us know. Somebody said, well, I got faith, Pastor. I, I, just, I read the word and I believe. But my, my question to you is, do you love God? Do you cherish God? Is he the love of your life? Do you, lo do you love what God has done? Do you have a moment where the love of God brings tears to your eyes or overwhelms you? you got to know what it means to love God. Listen to 1 Corinthians 13, what Paul said to the church at Corinth. They were a church where they had Apollos and they had all Paul's teaching, but they were so divided. They were so messed up because with all they had, they had a whole lot of word, a whole lot of what they called faith, which was empty faith, but they didn't love God. Listen to these words in that context. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Do you love God? That's what I'm talking about. Yep, talking to you. I see you looking at me. I'm asking you a question. You want God to deliver you, but do you love him? Look at the second verse. And though I have the gift of prophecy, all of this prophetic knowledge, and understand all mysteries. I can tell you all these mysteries and all this knowledge. And though I have faith so that I could remove a mountain. Listen, if I don't have love, I am nothing. Wow. I didn't say that. Paul said that. Maybe you need to start having a love affair with God because when you don't love someone, you don't trust them. Ooh. When you don't love them, you don't trust them. What are you talking about? Uh, one of these times I was at school and there was a young man who was being suspended for a whole heap of things he had done. I remember we called his mom in and the mom requested that I be in the office with the principal at the time. I'm sitting in the office, and we start running off all this stuff. So one of the counselors who was in there and the principal said, well, you know, um, how, how's the child's father doing? And the boy was just sitting there quiet, wasn't doing anything, just looking angry. Like, you know, he could eat, eat nails. And the mom was saying all of this, and all of a sudden the mom said, well, um, I'll tell his father. At the boy jumped up, got animated. He said, quit lying, mom. Now I'm jumping up saying, why are you talking to your mom like that? But he said, quit lying, mom. You know he don't care about me. He ain't coming up here. She lying to y'all. That man don't care whether I live or die. Did you hear what happened? He said, he's proven to me in the past he don't love me. Why should I trust that he's going to come help me? <laughs> Did you get, God is saying, if, 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 you don't if you don't love me, it means you don't trust me. And you don't trust me. I can't help you. So he said, first of all, how I know you love me is you keep my commandments. We have an interaction. We, we love. Jesus said in John 15, 13, he said, greater love 
have no man than this. This is Jesus talking about why he died for us. He's telling us why he died for us. This is what he said. Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friend. Jesus said when you love someone, that what happened. Look at verse 16. He said, and I will ask the Father. I'm going away. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate or comforter to help you and be with you. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells in you, and he will be in you. Does he dwell in you? The question is, see, this section, Jesus was trying to let them know. I told you he was speaking comfort. He said, I'm leaving, but don't worry. I, I'm going to ask the Father. What is that saying? Jesus said, when I get up to heaven, I'm not going to leave you down here by yourself. I'm going to ask the Father to send you another comforter. I've been comforting you, but now I'm going to ask the Father to send you another comforter, even the spirit of truth, whom the world can't receive, but you receive. He lives in you. You know what? We reduce the Holy Spirit to speaking in tongues, um, uh, Laying on of hands, um, shouting, you know, foaming, all of these extra outward things. But the Holy Spirit is God. He lives in us. And the Bible outlines very clearly what his ministry is. It's called the doctrine of the Holy Spirit or the doctrine of pneumatology. You will find out that God, the Holy Spirit, is a minister to your soul. You don't have to worry and be troubled because the Holy Spirit is right there with you. While you're awake, the Holy Spirit's awake. While you're troubled, the Holy Spirit is troubled. When you're going through, the Holy Spirit is saying, let me comfort you. I was sent here by God the Father and God the Son, and I'm God the Holy Spirit. I was sent to make sure you don't have an, 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 an abnormal time of suffering, worrying, anxiousness, and fears. I'm here. I'm the greatest comfort there is. And you're ignoring me. I'm talking to somebody right now. You get your comfort from these outward and, and listening to the world stuff. But Jesus Christ said, no, I will send you God the comforter. And here's the good thing. He lives in us. The doctrine of the Holy Spirit tells us that he lives in us. Um, Jesus fulfilled this promise in Acts 1 and 8. You remember. He was about to leave when he was translated. The Bible says in Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all the day of Samaria to the end of the earth. So once Jesus left, watch the sequence. The Holy Spirit came down. It worked the work through the apostles as they were beginning to take the word, the name of Jesus, and to go out and do mission work and make sure that the world would receive his word, just like we've been assigned to do. And then it says that the Spirit of God when we received him, it takes up residence in us. One of the reasons I shouldn't sit and cry uncontrollably. One of the reasons when I'm worried, I should be able to come back quickly. I got to go back and start talking to God the Father. So, look, I want somebody to hear me tonight. This will help you. Right in the chat, I got to talk to God more. I, I can't say it. That is, tell some, when you see somebody going through struggles, I want you to tell them, you got to talk to God the Holy Spirit a little more. The Holy Spirit hears you. I need to talk to God the Holy Spirit more. I do. Sometimes we let our emotions get us. We let other stuff get us. We need to be talking to God. But we need to understand that we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit um, is in a relationship with us. How good the relationship is depends on us. Let me give you some ways of what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. Write these down. You have paper. It'll bless you. I can't, I can't even cover not in this short period of time, all the ways the Holy Spirit blesses us. But I need you to hear this because it's in this text. It's Jesus speaking. I left, I'm a sinner comforter, so you can make sure you don't have anxiousness, worry, and fears. Watch this. He is our companion. This text tells us that. Verse 16 says, and he will be your advocate. Means lawyer. Speak for you. Defend you. Take when you hear him, he's bringing you out. He's arguing for your sanity. He's arguing for your peace. He's arguing for your deliverance because he lives in you. And he said, when I ask the Father, the Father's going to send him and that's who lives in you. Here's what I love. He is our prayer intercessor. You know what that means? 
And this, this verse, I, I gotta read the verse. I need you guys to go with me, because this verse, we read it, but we don't know how spectacular, how powerful this verse is. Romans 8, verses 26 and 27. It says, in the same way, the Spirit helps our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for. Romans 6, 8, 26, 27. Follow me. But the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. This is the NIV. And he searches our hearts. Uh, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Let's talk about it. Very simple. We're weak. God knew we were going to be weak. Worry is not your problem. Struggle is not your problem. We can all struggle. Problem is when you don't turn it over to the Holy Spirit. Problem is when you got the power of God right there with you and you allow yourself to go off because you forgot he's our intercessor. The Holy Spirit is the one who speaks to God for us. Look at, one, look at this, this text, what it just says. A couple of things why the why Holy Spirit has to intercede for us. The Bible says, in the same way, the Spirit helps our weakness. And then it goes down and talks about our word that's grown. If you go with me to Romans 22, I don't know if I even wrote that in there. He, he talks about, no, I don't even have it in my notes. I'll just tell you what it says. In Romans 22 and 23, it talks about how the animals, the creation, and the creatures are groaning until they are bought back or redeemed back to God. In the same way, that's where Romans 8, 26 picks up. In the same way, in our spirit, we feel helpless when the world crashes in on us. Somebody dies. I get a bad note from the doctor. My child is going through struggles. My money gets funny. One headache after another. I take one test and the doctor wants another test. It looks like everything's going wrong. I don't find a good minute. I'm in constant pain. All of those things are real. But because we are weak and helpless, so the first thing is we're helpless. The Holy Spirit prays for us because of our helplessness. So you don't ever have to worry about that. When you're going through, understand that the Holy Spirit is right there praying for you. He also groans for us because inside, when you have a relationship with God, how many of you would admit this? Now, I know this, I don't want this, this to, I want you to get this twisted. I want you to understand what I'm saying. Aren't there moments in your life, this is not, you know, a spirit of suicide and all that, but where you just sometimes long to, when, when a breath or a thought of heaven can be, that's going to be, man, this new body, a place of paradise, a place of peace. Look, I'm not saying I want to leave here now. I'm not saying anything wrong. But I'm saying every now and then that joy flows through my body to know I'm going to be set when I leave here. One of the biggest worries is you don't understand existentially what's going on in your life because you're not secure because you haven't made your peace with God. And so you don't have that same Holy Spirit in, inside of you letting you know every now and then. He'll give you a glimpse. Hallelujah. He'll give you a hope and say, you know what? All you're doing means nothing. I was talking to somebody today. Some of our brothers and sisters who get caught up, and I'm going to say this, and I need you to hear this. You get caught up in black Israelites, whether black men were the first people, whether or not the white man has made a picture of Jesus and we're following these white pictures. Can I tell you something? Look, look what you just said to me. You're going to build a whole religion on changing stuff down here. You want to build a whole religion on whether or not I, as a black man, get my rights down here. None of that's important. You're going to eternity. The only thing important to you is, do I know Jesus Christ as my Savior? Have I made my peace with God? I don't care if it's a white man picture, black man picture, whoever it is. The crazy thing to me is, this life is temporal, and you want to change my religion based on all the things I'm doing wrong in this life. And you'll build a whole religion on it. And you'll walk around with different kind of clothes on, outward appearance. You'll walk around with all kind of other outward things. I don't do this. I don't do Christmas. I don't pass. All of that. With none of that, according to Galatians, Jesus Christ and him alone. What gets us to heaven is going through, is making sure that we have Jesus. As I say, I know somebody don't like me. Put in the chat, you want to agree with me? If you want to, I'll talk with you if you want to talk about it. Because the reality is... On this side, we may spend 100 years. You may spend 104 years. But where we're going is what gives us comfort. You know what gives me peace? When I can lay down and know that I have peace with my Savior. And even if I'm dying, I know where I'm going. 
So I don't have to worry about the devil saying, you're dying, you're dying. I'm not, I'm, so what? I was born to die. I've been born again. And I'm going to see the Father. I'll probably get some, you know, some text on that. But I'm sharing with you why I think we make too much out of trying to build a life here. The life here ain't what God saved you for. He saved you so you can get other folks saved so we can have a life there when everything is over. What else does he do? He convicts us of sin. John 16, 8. It's the Holy Spirit that makes me realize I need God. And thank God he did. How many of us know, you with me, just put a hand in, put some clapping hands, whatever you want to put. Let somebody know, I am glad I found God. I don't know where, where are the real people at? I don't know where I would, I'm crazy. I don't know where I'd be without God right now. I've dealt some, some hard stuff. And who's to say I wouldn't have this hard stuff to deal with even, you know, even uh, before if I didn't have God. And the reality is, one of the reasons that the Holy Spirit intercedes for us and watches us and with words we can't say is because once we get saved, sometimes our, our pain doubles. We have to, because now we got the physical pain, then we got the spiritual pain, meaning that we can see some of the hopelessness in the world and just continue to cry out. Any criers out there that know my heart cries out for somebody else to find what I found in Jesus. Look what else the Holy Spirit does. It seals us. Ephesians 1.13. Can I read it? In him, Christ, Ephesians 1.13, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. Here's what God says. He makes sure that he knows, it's almost like monogramming your church, right? He seals us for ownership. He tells us that we are his. He makes us authentic. It's one of those things where I'm under your divine seal, your divine protection. So when the enemy comes to try to do things in my life, if I haven't opened the door, he got to get permission from God. And if I pray, he's got to leave very fast because I'm sealed under the protection of God. The truth of the gospel has blessed me to the point that he can only go so far. There's some folk out there that will tell you some things the devil used to do to me. He can't even do anymore because of what I know about God. All right. He indwells us. Remember I said in Acts, the, the, the Bible tells us, and I want you to understand the transition of this. The Bible says that, um, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. Well, that language also is letting us know in the New Testament, once Jesus was fulfilled, once he went back to glory and sat down, the Bible says the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Here's, here's how I know, Romans 8 and 11. Listen to the Bible. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus from the dead. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. Let somebody know, God dwells in me. When you're in your house right now, if you could just shout it out to yourself, God dwells in me. Why am I worried? Why am I fearful when God dwells in me? Enemy, do you get it? God is saying, I'm right here with you through the worst pain, through your cancer treatment, through your operations. I'm there for your sorrow of grieving. And, and when you're going through bereavement, I am God. I am with you. How do we know? Because of the next thing he teaches us. That's right here in this verse, in this chapter. Verse 26 of this 14th chapter says, but the helper, there it is again. Why are you worried when he helps you? The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things because he is God. The Spirit is a teacher who surpasses all others. God is saying, I will teach you mysteries if you get close to me. I will teach you the secret of being peaceful in the middle of the worst travesty in your life. I will teach you how to gain strength out of weakness. I will teach you how to turn around any situation, I know I got a witness out there. Won't God turn it around? He can. I know some folk who had children. You know, we have children, and we watched the miracle of God, the promise He made in His Word that said to us, um, if we raise them up the way they should go, it's, the Bible says they may depart, but they'll come back. We watch God's promise as our children get a relationship with God on their own. And what's, what's good about that is when, when that promise 
comes to them and they understand that God who dwells in us made the promise and that God now dwells in them. He will teach us how to become. One of the, one of the hardest things for parents, and you can be truthful with me, is wondering if we ever did enough. The hardest thing for a parent is how much did I contribute to you know, some of the pain or dysfunction of my child. All of us deal with that. But the reality is the Holy Spirit will reveal a truth to you that since he won't leave us and you've taught your child without me, that we, we've in essence done enough that God can turn that life around. I need somebody listening to me because I felt some of you out there. If you are claiming God to turn the life of your child around, put it in the chat so we can pray with you. Send it out. We're going to intercede with you tonight that God is going to turn it around. That it that it won't stay the same. We're gonna we're gonna join hands and touch and agree because that's what God does. Oh, I just felt that. He reveals truth to us. First Corinthians two and twelve. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. The Holy Spirit is the one who lets me know I'm missing out on some stuff. <laughs> and he brings it back to me so I can know. I can't go through all of this. I'm just going to run them off. You guys going to have to, uh, uh, you have to look this up. I will give you an address. He helps us bear fruit. In Galatians 5, 22, 23. When my life is getting weak and I can't bear the fruit of love, joy, peace, kindness. And he's the one that strengthens me to bear it. The Holy Spirit is a reminder. He brings back things to our memory. We need that one. John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send, will bring back to your remembrance everything God said to you. You know, in the middle of a tragedy, when a verse came to you, that was the Holy Spirit. He equips us with spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. He equips us. What does that mean? There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so deep. All the gifts we talk about, and in their action, in the way that they are used, is guided by the Holy Spirit. That's why it's a travesty sometimes how the world takes gifts out of the context of what God said. When the Holy Spirit wants to tell us how to use those gifts. Empowers us. You will receive power. We talked about that. Fills us. Oh, I love this one. Ephesians 5.18 talks about we will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Right? That comes from us being with Him. So, we shouldn't worry. Because God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And when we keep his commandments, he said, I go to the Father to send you a comforter who does all of these things in your life. But this last section is a section you need to get down because all of the teaching is coming to a culmination in this section. Are you with me? Verse 18. The last thing I want to tell you about the comfort God gave you is that we always, one of the reasons you shouldn't worry, we always, even if you're by yourself, well, you're never by yourself if you have God. But never, ever, ever worry because he said, you always have access to me. And I will meet your needs. And you belong to me. I am your family. How do I know? We're picking up with verse 18. And we're going down to what I consider to be the, 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 the uh, mountaintop of this chapter. Are you with me? Look at verse 18. I will not leave you as orphans. I just said it. You're not in search of a father. You're not in search of a home. You're not in search of things. God said, you're not an orphan. Put down your, your mind to take you like you don't have help. Like you don't have something. I, I, I will not leave you as an orphan. I will come to you. Yet a little while. The world will see me no more. But you will see me. Even when he left, he said, you have access to me. You have access to me no matter what your situation is. Someone right now in your house, you have access to God. You have access to your Father. Well, don't walk around letting all this stuff happen to you. you have, look what he said. You have, the world can't see me, but you can see me. Because I live, you will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in the Father, you in me, and I in you. Watch the state. He's in the Father, we're in him, and he's in us. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. 
and I will love and manifest myself to him. We have access to God. God said, when you love me, God the Father, we're in harmony with the entire uh, Godhead. That means God the Father loves me, the Spirit is already in me, and we will manifest ourselves to you. God said, because, I'm telling you why not to worry and not have fears, and not be anxious, because at that moment God is in you. Judas, not Iscariot, the other, the other apostle, said, you know, in verse 22, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and live in him. That's how. That's how the world won't know me, because the world's not trying to live in love with God. We're getting there. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And the word that the Father's, here, my Father sent you, you will not understand me. Look at verse 25. These things have I spoken to you while I'm still with you. Again, he's reassuring the access. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things to bring into my remembrance. Here's the word I've been trying to get to. But let me see. Here's where we are. Peace, Jesus said. I leave with you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world give I give it unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Stop. We started this text set. Don't lose me now. We started this text with let not your heart be troubled. At the end, Jesus is trying to tell you because he was giving comfort. And he was giving peace to his disciples, right? Because they had heard all of this. And they know he was leaving. He said, I want to make sure they know it. But then Jesus said, peace I leave with you. We've been talking about that. But then he flips it on us right here and said, my peace. Did you get it? Jesus said, I'm not just giving you peace that I don't know nothing about. I came down here in your body, and with everything that's been happening to me, I'm sitting here knowing I'm about to go to the cross. I'm sitting here knowing I'm about to be separated from my Father. I'm sitting here knowing that I got to do the plan of redemption, and yet I have peace. Oh, here's where it's at. Jesus is saying, I'm not telling you about peace that I don't have, so I'm not giving you worldly peace. I'm giving you my peace, and my peace has been tried and tested. How do you get God's peace? It's in the context, it's in us understanding, not as the world give it, give I unto you. Here's what Jesus is saying, and don't overlook this. The reason I can give you peace is because right now, disciples talking to you in this room, I know I'm about to be betrayed, and I know where I'm going, but I have a supernatural peace. How did you get it, Jesus? One word. Not as the world. Here's what the world makes you think. Here's why people commit suicide. Here's why people search for new wives and new husbands all the time. Here's why people is running around trying to get more money. Here's why people's identity is based in their cars and their houses and the diamonds and all. All of that is in a search for trying to find this great place of no longing. Where I'm just sitting around, never aroused by what's, what's out there. If I got enough money, I don't have to be affected by anything. I have this peace. I'm immune to everything. There is no such place. There were priests who locked themselves in caves, trying not to be affected by the sin nature they had trying to find a way that they could get rid of the, the, all of the pain. And they still never found peace in all of the whipping of their bodies and their mind because that's not real peace. Can I tell you, it's not real to live in this world and think you're going to have a day where your peace is contingent upon you having enough stuff that you don't have to worry. That's not peace. That's a fairy tale. The second thing the world makes you think peace is is when you walk around and say, I don't care. You know why some people just walk around? Especially, I, I've seen this again when I'm dealing with young kids in school. I say, man, I don't care what you do to me, Mr. Douglas. I don't care. You know what they're saying? I'm just trying to find some peace. I need to get out. I need to skip school and, you know, go find me a place where I can get high. I need some peace. What they're saying is, I don't want to care. We feel an unresponsive uh, action to what's going on around us is peace. That's not peace. So you can sit up there. When you go to the hospital and you see somebody in an, induced, in an induced coma, when you see somebody laying there and they're dying on the inside, they're dying on the inside, what you're saying, you wouldn't walk in there and say, oh, they look so peaceful because they're non-responsive. Peace is not non-responsive. Did you get this? The, world, the reason you're never going to be happy because you're looking for something the world says is peace and that's why they go crazy because they can't find it. Here's what real peace is. Jesus' peace. Watch me. Here it is. The real peace 
is Jesus had strong emotions. Jesus was just like us. He came and got in our body. He knew what we're going through. And yet, he did it all with the Father's peace in his life. Because real peace is not looking away from it, but facing it. Not saying, I don't care, but being able to cast care that's hurting me on God. Not saying it's not bad, but saying it's bad, but my God is great. Oh, I hope somebody's praising God with me. It's not saying it's this trouble. It's not saying I'm not really sick. It's not saying I don't really have a bad situation with my family. It's not saying we got all the money. It's saying whatever we got, God is better. How do I know? How do I know? John 12, 27. Look at what Jesus said. This is when he found out what was getting ready to happen. He said, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? He answered his question. He said, no. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Now I want you to come close and I want you to write this down so the next time you are troubled, I want you to look at this, what you wrote. I want you to write it because Jesus just told us, real peace comes from keeping my mind on my prayer. I can't be worried now. I got a purpose. I know God has more for me to do. Oh, somebody hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? I know God's not done. See, what happens is when the devil can tell you it's over because you have you don't know your purpose. When you know your purpose is not over, you're not going to sit and worry. You're going to say, God's going to take me to a place where I can get to my purpose. Here's what he said. We need to know that I don't have to worry if everything's falling apart because purpose brings peace. People who die don't have purpose. People who run around with no purpose are the ones who walk around with a lot of worry and anxiety. And they try to find purpose in empty things. But real purpose is in God. You can admit, and somebody ought to let somebody know, I found no real peace for the trouble in my life until I found my purpose in God. And I know God still has a purpose for me, so I'm not going to sit here and just worry my life away. What am I talking about? Acts, chapter 27. Remember the text? Paul was being taken to Rome because he said, I want to go to Caesar. And on the way, they hit this big hurricane. And the Bible says, in verse 22, Paul said this of the 27th chapter of the book of Acts. Paul said, but now I urge you. They were, about, they were all concerned because the ship was being tossed and turned. Verse 22, Paul said, now I urge you to keep up your courage. This is what he prophesied. But now one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of God, to whom I belong, whom I serve, stood beside me and said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously given me all of you or your lives because you sailed with me. Here's what Paul said. Because you're on this ship with me and God said, I got to go to Caesar, we're not going to die. This is what he said. Here's the word. Here's, here's how you know Paul was focused on his purpose. He said, the angel told me you must stand for Caesar. Next time the enemy comes in your life, next time the devil comes at you, because you know you're, you got a work to do for the Lord, you ought to tell him, no, I must continue my purpose in God. People's lives are dependent on me. I'm an usher. I got to do the best ushering I can so when people walk into God's house, they see me standing there on my post knowing God is still alive. And even if this church is in a pandemic, we are moving forward. We're installing our officers on Sunday. One of the reasons I want to install these officers so they can know, don't get caught up in this doom, gloom, darkness this world is saying, like nothing's ever going to be right. As long as we have God, we're right. So if you're an officer, we're going to install ourselves for the purpose that God has ahead of us. Jesus was sitting there saying, one of y'all going to betray me. When you're going to go to the cross, I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to leave my father. And yet, he has peace. Secondly, write this one down, and we're going to close on this one. Peace is not a matter of opinion, but a matter of conviction. That is so good. Many of you don't know your convictions. When the pandemic came, many people found out they were not as sold out to Christ in a pandemic as they were when it was not one. And I'm not talking about your attendance. I'm talking about not letting the world push you away from your walk in Christ. Not too much technology out there for you to tell me this is the first time you've been in Bible study in two weeks. Or I just go to Bible study when I want. 
That's not a that's not a conviction. Conviction brings you peace because you're convicted about God. What am I saying? Opinions change. Oprah can change your opinion tomorrow. New knowledge can change your opinion. Different circumstances can change your opinion, change your opinion. But when you're convicted, nobody can shake you. You know why? Because conviction is when you have an unshakable truth and you're willing to die for it. Opinion, if you die for an opinion, you will die worried, dark, screaming, and in terror. But if you die with a conviction, you will die trusting that I'm doing it for God. You got to figure out yourself. Is my relationship with God just my opinion about Jesus? I just know, you know, it's pretty cool me going to church and being saved and I don't want to go to hell. But am I convicted about Jesus? Let's, let me show you scriptures that show you the difference. Children of Israel in Exodus chapter 14, they just got delivered from Egypt. And they were praying for years till God heard them. God showed up. Yay, the deliverer. They, they thought they, they got, they came out leaving out with all kind of jewels and everything. Well, it said they got to Red Sea. You know, the devil shook Pharaoh and said, why you let them go? And he dressed up and started coming after them. We'll pick it up in the 10th verse of the 14th chapter. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were Egyptians marching after them. And they were terrified, the Bible says. And they cried out. They said, Moses, was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you brought us to this desert to die? What have we done to us bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say, leave us alone? No, you didn't say, leave us alone. You lying. But what happened is, it was just your opinion that you wanted to be delivered. But once you have faith in God, you don't scream like that. Let me give you the difference. Here is Daniel, chapter 3, verse 16 and 18. I'm giving you the difference between having an opinion about God and having a conviction where your life depends on and you're ready to die for God. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 and 18. King Nebuchadnezzar said, look, they brought him before Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow, you're going to burn. And you're getting ready to go down into the fiery furnace. All you got to do when you hear the sound of that music is bow. Listen to cool and calm Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hey, listen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to defend ourselves for you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it. And he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship your golden image you have set up. Now, did you see anywhere where they screamed? Did you see them frightened? Did you hear anywhere in all that where they said, oh, we don't want to go in the fire. Oh, what about them? Never. What they said was, my God is able. That's a conviction. My God is able. That's a conviction of your faith. Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Need to be heard. Oh, I'm sorry. Not as the world give you. The real peace you should be seeking after is a peace where you search your heart to know. I'm convicted about this thing in my walking God. Nothing can shake me. I don't need no preachers. I don't need no. I have a personal relationship with God. So when worry comes, worry can't bother you because you already got a conviction of truth. You know the truth. Greater is he that's in you than in the world. You know the truth. God can heal sickness. You know the truth. God said I will supply all your needs. You know the truth. God said I can take any situation and I will be with you. And he said I'll, I'll help you when you're up. I'll help you when you're down. And so Paul said in Philippians, I learned how to be content in all states. The truth will make you free when it's time to worry. You won't worry. And then, but if you only have an opinion, I feel sorry for you because you're not going to make it. Let me read the last part of this so we know where God is going, what God, where God is taking. My peace, peace I leave with you. God said, I leave you victory over stress, trials, and anxiety. But, not as the world gives you. My peace I give you. And my peace comes when you understand your purpose. 
my piece comes. If I can go all the way back and recap because I'm done with this series, please share this series with somebody. Go in and let them know. The enemy's lying to us and stealing from us because we don't know. First thing you have to understand in this powerful, magnificent chapter is the fact that God is sovereign. He's the only one that can say, let anything. And by his sovereignty, his presence, his authority, and his control is always there. Then we found out he left us with deliverance. He said, the works that I do, same works you can do. I'm with you. I go to the Father. Because I go to the Father, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He tells us what to do. And then in this last section, he tells us, look, I'm not just telling you about peace. I'm telling you about something I lived so I can give you an example and set you free. God bless you. Mm, I'm not I, God bless you. I hope you enjoy this text. I hope you enjoy this teaching. Go back and you look at it as many times as you want. And I ask you, please, reach out and help us here at this ministry. I shared with you last week how many, how many people we feed every month. How many people with clothing and feeding. You need to know if you go and look on our, on our site, you will find out that our CDC, our Development Corporation, is moving and growing and still supplying. And if you go to ShilohBaptistChurches.org or .com, Shiloh, all one word, ShilohBaptistChurches, with a, with a plural, .org, you'll come to our website and then you'll see the Give button. Push the Give button. You can give by PayPal. You can give by Gillify. We have a Gillify. You can actually mail in. You can give by Cash App. There's a Cash App number there. Whatever. But when you give to this ministry, it's so we can get out content like this to change somebody's life. It's Pastor Duncan saying, God bless you. See you Sunday morning. Thank you again for joining us in this powerful worship. Have a great night.